great group. I think we're going to get started because I have a feeling this evening is going to be um, lots of great talk from our presenter and some great questions and communication from everybody else. This is an exciting evening. Uh, first, hello and welcome to the Theodore Roosevelt Inaugural National Historic Site, especially for those who may be here for the first time. But I see a lot of familiar faces, so I don't think everybody's new. Thank you for being here. Um, it is an absolute honor to have Dr. Michael Patrick Coney with us this evening uh, to present Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost. I love that um, October connection there. It's kind of cool with the ghoulishness. The History and Memory of an American Icon. Uh, Dr. Cullinane is the Professor of U.S. History and Loman Walton Chair of Theodore Roosevelt Studies at Dickinson State University in North Dakota. He is Public Historian of the Theodore Roosevelt Association. He is an author, host of a popular podcast, which many of you may be familiar with, The Gilded Age and Progressive Era, and he's written for The Washington Post. In Dr. Cullinane's words, when he was describing his program, he said, Theodore Roosevelt died over 100 years ago, and yet debate still erupts over his legacy. The removal of statues, the erection of new memorials, and his appearance in pop culture all show the relevance of TR today. Um, so that's, that's a great, um, great place to, uh, to introduce Michael. Um, but I do want to remind you folks, after Michael's presentation, there will be a period of time for questions and answers. And we also will have refreshments for you in the room behind us. So, uh, so it's going to be a fun evening. And uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Michael Patrick Cullinan. Actually, I was on the plane from Boston to Buffalo. Uh, getting here, and there were so many sad faces. I am so sorry about this weekend. I watched the game knowing that I was coming here, and then I got on the plane, and there was a bunch of Bills fans, some from Canada, some from Buffalo, and it was, it was so depressing. So, um, yeah. All right, well, um, so here's what I'd like to do today. I'm going to give a short talk. I'm not going to bore you with... Um, a lecture. Uh, rather, I'd like if we could do this a little bit more interactive. So one of the things, one of the big developments in the world of Theodore Roosevelt, and you're a part of that because you're here in Buffalo and this is an important site of memory, this place that we're in right now. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is for us to think about being agents of his memory, for us to be uh, actively considering how we would memorialize Roosevelt. So we know that a, a statue, Pat has mentioned, the, the famous statue in front of the American Museum of Natural History has come down. Uh, it's actually in North Dakota, um, uh, it, although it won't be going up at the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library, not, not yet at least, anyway. Um, and we are in the process, uh, I also work for the Presidential Library in, in a as a consultant on some of the historical matters, and they are thinking about how they're going to memorialize Roosevelt in several rooms. But the last room is going to be a room dedicated to his legacy. And I, I would love to know your thoughts, because this is a very live conversation. How do you memorialize Roosevelt in one room? Uh, the last room, in an experience that's going to take you maybe two or three hours to get through. What's that lasting impression that you want to have? So in the Q&A, if you've got ideas, I'm all ears. But also, who would you cast for a movie with Theodore Roosevelt in it? You know, Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese have this new movie out, but their long-standing project that they keep on talking about is a movie about Theodore Roosevelt, with Leonardo DiCaprio as, as Roosevelt. I don't know if he's my pick. Um, Nick Offerman, maybe, from Parks and Recreation. He seems a better fit sometimes. But who would you cast? And, and, and all of these things, what, what statue would you uh, mold or, or, or cast? Um, I think all of these questions are relevant, and hopefully what today's talk is going to do is situate yourself as the, the agent of memory. Not me, I'm just here as a moderator, really, and you're, you are the person who gets to think about uh, TR's memory. So uh, let's go back to that day in 1919 when he passes away. That's Ethel Roosevelt's bedroom. That's the room that Theodore Roosevelt dies in, January 6, uh, 1919. So it is the warmest room in the house. And you can kind of see that in the photo, right? The sun comes up over. Oyster Bay and shines right into Ethel's room. 
So after Christmas 1918, well, Ro Ro Roosevelt comes home. I should say he's pretty sick in 1918. He spends about seven, eight weeks in Roosevelt Hospital in New York City, and he's got a number of, of medical problems, abscesses in his legs that have been causing him problems. He caught mal two different strains of malaria in Brazil and Cuba, dating back to 1898. Uh, he's deaf in one ear, he's blind in one eye. I mean, he's really been through the ringer, and he's only 60 years old. Um, so he's there in that room because everyone's left after Christmas. All of the kids, well, not all of the kids, his daughters, Alice and Ethel are home with uh, his son, Archie. His son, Quentin, is of course, he passed away six months earlier uh, in France. He shot down and, uh, and killed pretty much instantaneously in France. And his other two sons, Kermit and Ted, are still in France. So it's kind of like a half household for Christmas 1918. They all leave, when they leave, he moves into Ethel's room there. And in the early hours of January 6th, uh, Roosevelt seems absolutely fine. He's in that room with uh, his close assistant, James Amos, who's his valet, he calls him, but what we would kind of call our personal assistant nowadays. And James Amos is stoked to fire in the corner of the room. It's lovely and warm. Roosevelt's under covers. Uh, he's been given some medication and he, he falls asleep. And Amos just sits in a chair in the corner of the room listening to his friend Roosevelt, the former president, uh, sleep. And he listens and his breathing is pretty normal for quite a while until about, uh, about four in the morning. And then Amos is actually woken up when he hears Roosevelt's breathing, which is, uh, he described it as, um, what is it, deep gulps of air followed by short, shallow puffs. And so he races over to Roosevelt and he feels his head and it's dry and it's warm and he thinks he's okay. But just to be safe, he, he fetches the nurse who's only a, a couple of rooms down and the nurse runs into the room with Amos and Roosevelt stopped breathing entirely. And that's it, he's, he's passed away. And so the nurse runs over to Edith Roosevelt, his wife's room, to collect her. She obviously runs it in a panic, tries to pour brandy into Roosevelt's lifeless mouth and that's when she realizes that her husband is dead. And uh, so what does she do? She calls the doctor straight away. Do doctor lives just down the road so in Five or 10 minutes, the doctor is there and declares Roosevelt dead and takes Mrs. Roosevelt downstairs, lights a fire, and they just sit in quiet for an hour. They say nothing to each other. Um, her daughter would say that she felt, uh, she was absolutely dumbfounded by the moment. All right, the news of, the Roosevelt, of Roosevelt's death um, begins to spread as the sun sets, uh, sorry, the sun rises over uh, Oyster Bay, Long Island. Edith uh, was then thrown into the duties of uh, preparing a funeral. So she contacts her sister-in-law, Corinne, Corinne actually is her, how you pronounce it? Her sister-in-law, Anna, and her two daughters, Alice and Ethel, who, um, who are now coming home. E Ethel was uh, in South Carolina, she takes a train up. Alice Roosevelt Longworth is in Washington. She takes the train up and they're there within a day. Uh, Archie Roosevelt telegrams his brothers Kermit and Ted and says the old lion is dead. Although long before that telegram reaches them, um, uh, Kermit and Ted are informed by their commanding officer that, uh, that their father had passed away. In fact, they were all together, Kermit, Ted, and uh, Ethel's husband, Dick Darby, who was a surgeon in the war, which is some comfort to uh, Edith and her family that the, the three boys are together in France. They're on their way home. They leave for France immediately. Uh, Roosevelt, as I said, he was only 60 years old and I guess we could say he was semi-retired from politics, although he is the most con conspicuous Republican of 1919. In fact, there's speculation that he would have run for president again, although uh, we can talk about that. I don't think it would have happened. He was pretty ill. Um, and this, the way he dies, the, you know, what I've just described is really uncharacteristic of the man we know. He goes quietly without any fanfare. In fact, Thomas Marshall, the vice president, says famously, death had to take him in his sleep. Otherwise, there would have been a fight. Um, which that is, that kind of comports with our idea of TR a little bit more. Um, president Woodrow Wilson orders all buildings to drape black cloth out, out of them and all flags that have masks. Wilson actually finds out about Roosevelt's death en route to, uh, to France from Italy. He's uh, abroad about to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles and people are watching him because 
he's told that Roosevelt's died and th the other people on the boat know, know already. He's one of the last people on the boat to be told. And so people are watching him intently and apparently his face went through a number of different transformations until it settled on content and happy. Uh, because of course he was Roosevelt's you know, great nemesis in terms of politics and he really hated him. I mean really hated him. So he was you know, satisfied. Although he does go through the normal sort of um, the sort of normal range of activities, you know, of, of mourning a, a former president. The, the Congress adjourns, the Supreme Court adjourns, which, you know, if you know during session, the Supreme Court very rarely adjourns. Uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, White says it, it, they, that he did it with a deep sense of sorrow that Roosevelt meant that much to him. In New York City, the aldermen canceled the day's business, and the New York Tribune wrote uh, that the city, one sentiment prevailed in the city, deep regret tinged by a sense of personal bereavement. And it's that idea of personal bereavement that I thought was really interesting because this is not just um, a sense of like the nation lost a president, but this was, according to the newspaper, this was something that individuals would, um, would take differently. And this is the thing that I'd like you to focus on. I'll keep on repeating it so we don't forget it, but the way individuals interpret Roosevelt's death has great significance for his legacy and, and what I'm gonna be talking about later. Two days later, Roosevelt's family inter his body at uh, Young Cemetery. And if you've been to Oyster Bay, it's not a million miles away from here, uh, you'll know that uh, Sagamore Hill is up on a beautiful hill. You can just about see the bay. And then if you go about a mile down the hill is Young Cemetery, which is a private cemetery. Um, but it is not a particularly grand or uh, elegant or uh, outlandish. It's, it's very simple, very modest. And his burial is very simple and very modest. You can see there, the lower picture is actually his grave, which is from 1919. Today, the grave has a stone and a black uh, fence around the, the grave. Um, but that was never the intention. The intention was just to have a very simple grave, maybe with a very small stone to mark where he passed. And again, this seems really out of character with the man that we know, the big sort of loud and brash and you know, uh, effervescent, exuberant person that's Theodore Roosevelt. But in actuality, this is what he wanted. And I could, I could tell you a little bit more about his modesty in the Q&A, especially around memorials and his legacy. But he wanted a very quiet death and quiet remembrance. He demanded that there be no music or sermons in the church. He didn't want anyone at the church except for family and friends that Edith invited. And so Edith follows his wishes. She doesn't even go to the church. She stays at home, which is like a very Victorian thing to do. Um, and there are no sermons, there are no eulogies, there are no hymns sung. When he's buried, they simply walk up the hill, process, they bury him, and they, a few words, and then they walk away. And when people went to the funeral, they, were, uh, they said that they, were, they felt like this was um, not a suitable way for a man of Roosevelt's stature to go out to be uh, commemorated after, after his death. Now, Edith was lucky because you can kind of see in the photo there that there's a heavy snow that fell uh, on the ground the day before, but there was double the amount of trains put on from New York City to Oyster Bay. People crowd the town. They fill the, um, the church, Christ Church, the Episcopal Church, down in Oyster Bay, so much so that there's, they say that there's 400 or 500 people outside of the church as well as the 100 that are inside. It's kind of a madhouse. And interestingly, uh, the last person standing at Roosevelt's grave is William Howard Taft, who's crying his eyes out. In fact, someone wrote that the only thing you could hear was a buoy in the harbor dinging and Taft crying. Um, so this is a really interesting moment because again, it doesn't really fit with our idea of how we might commemorate Roosevelt. And in the few hours preceding the funeral, James Earl Fraser, the same person who uh, made the bronze statue at the American Museum of Natural History, goes into the house, up the stairs to Ethel's bedroom where Theodore Roosevelt's body lies, and he puts plaster all over his face and plaster all over his hands in order to create that. That is the death mask, which is a very popular thing in the 19th century, 18th century. Not so popular anymore, because it's kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> but uh, this, uh, actually, <laughs> funny story. Um, I would like this to be in the library, uh, but I am not gonna get my wishes because people don't wanna see Theodore Roosevelt's dead face. But that, that is the actual death mask. There are copies of them. Uh, there's one in Sagamore Hill uh, that you can go see. 
And Fraser casts this uh, uh, in the moments before he gets put into uh, the coffin and uh, then later put into the ground. The reason why I did it was that, scul so sculptors in later years could have a, a, a good record, you know, and a good um, idea of what Roosevelt looked like. I mean, this is literally taken from his face and from his hands, but the funeral goers that, that come and see the death mask they are not happy with this. They see it and they say, this is not Roosevelt. And there's a poet that comes, a guy called Frank uh, Owen Payne, who looked at the mold and studied it and came away thinking that the same thing, this is not Theodore Roosevelt. And he wrote a poem. I'm just gonna give you a, a quick bit of that verse. He wrote, uh, can this be your face, this whose calm repose portrays no presence but cold, dreamless sleep? This is not you, this bit of smooth, still earth, for you walk straight away to the throne above and ask God cheerily, what's to do up here? So like that's our, that's our sense of him, right? Not this dead uh, piece of plaster. Frazier's death mask really frustrated those who knew Roosevelt, who complained that it lacked Roosevelt's audac audacity. But I think what they really meant was that this lacked his soul. This doesn't have the soul of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and it reflects uh, the public's discontent with other posthumous portrayals of Roosevelt as well. But this one to me is interesting because it is literally from his face. You can't get any closer. I mean, anything that comes later is gonna be even further removed from Theodore Roosevelt, but this is him. And yet people felt it wasn't. So the press at home and the press abroad began to publish a number of encomiums and memorials. Poets began to write more poems. Sculptors began to create bigger sculptors, sculptures in order to memorialize a man who wanted a very modest uh, uh, life after death, I suppose. And this is where we get to uh, the big like philosophical point that I wanna make. And I'm sorry, this is super heavy and I'm gonna go really slow, but it's really important. This idea uh, that John Dewey has about Theodore Roosevelt. So if you don't know who John Dewey is, he is, quite possibly one of the most brilliant Americans of all time. He is a 20th century philosopher and educator. Uh, I, social studies uh, uh, teachers in the front are nodding. I know who John Dewey is. Um, education in America is shaped by this man. I mean, progressive politics in America is shaped by this man. And uh, he's one of very few American philosophers of uh, the early 20th century. Uh, Dewey joins the grieving multitude in 1919. He knew Roosevelt well. In fact, in 1912, he was a progressive and he rallied to Roosevelt's progressive party when he broke away from the Republicans. Uh, but Dewey's a philosopher and you know, n no philosopher sees the world in a, in, um, a sort of monolithic way. They're, everything's complicated. In fact, philosophers, their job is to complicate things. <laughs> so that's what Dewey is gonna do. And he doesn't see Roosevelt as infallible. He doesn't see him as perfect. He sees him as a very complicated figure. So he venerates part of him, but not all of them. And he, he believed this, that um, the compulsion to recall facets of his life would become popular. That people would begin to look at parts of Roosevelt and say that they liked that, but that they wouldn't look at the totality of Roosevelt and latch onto that because it was too hard to grapple with. You know, and think about yourself as well. Or I, I often think of Walt Whitman in his poem, um, Song of Myself, where he says, do I contradict myself? So I do, I contain multitudes. I mean, think about yourself. You're not easy to explain. If you had to sell your biography to a publisher tomorrow, where would you start? And that's kind of what Dewey is saying, is that people are gonna start picking out parts of Roosevelt because it'll be too complicated to look at the whole. And he, he said that this came from a natural urge to impose contemporary context and personal desires on the memories of the past. That we take what we know now and we look back and we use the past for now. And that I think is really interesting. He defined commemoration as something that is inherently subjective, an act that will reflect the aspirations of those who remember, but not the past. I mean, I suppose other people have put this better when they've said the past is a foreign land. You know, we can't go there. Um, Dewey prophesized that a Roosevelt doppelganger would emerge. He called it a double. The Roosevelt double would emerge. And this is what he said. Of every man who goes into political life, there gradually grows up a double. The double consists of the acts of the original individual reflected first in the imagination and then in the desires and acts of other men. A Roosevelt double would grow particularly immense, Dewey said, because his capture of the imagination of his countrymen was so complete. Now, 
Let me just break this down because this is the most important part of the talk, and yet it is, of course, the most complicated part of the talk. So Dewey says there's a double, and the first part of it is not, it doesn't even have to do with Roosevelt. Put Roosevelt aside. It has to do with Roosevelt in our imagination. Plato used to say, you know, close your eyes and think of a chair. And everyone in this room would draw a different picture, right? But if I asked everyone to do the same with Roosevelt, they might have a mustache, he might have a pince-nez, but chances are every one of those images will look different. Roosevelt, in your imagination, is distinct and unique. And that's what Dewey is saying in that first half of uh, the statement. In the other half, what he's saying is, is that when we project Roosevelt into the world, he becomes even more complicated and he reflects our desires, what we want Roosevelt to be an actor for. So first he begins in our imagination and that's completely made up in our own minds based on what we know of the past. And then when we put him into the world, like we put him onto a bust or we put him into a story, then he becomes something else. He's there for a purpose. He serves a purpose. And that to me is incredibly interesting to think that there's a reason why there's a statue in front of the American Museum of Natural History, and there's a reason why it's not there anymore. And that's because Roosevelt exists in our imagination in 1936 when it goes up, he exists in our imagination now, and he serves two very different purposes then and now. And also there's a Maasai warrior and a Native American that are in a racial hierarchy, but that has to do with our time now. We are more considerate of racial ideas and the way they're deployed in our culture than we would have been in the 1930s. So what Dewey is saying is everything fits into its context. You can't take a statue from 1936 and fit it into 2023. Uh, not necessarily, but you know, so things can change. It's the same reason why Robert E. Lee comes down and why he goes up when he goes up as well. All right, Theodore Roosevelt's ghost evolved from a double uh, at the time of his death to what I would say is now a multifaceted, or as Edmund Morris said, a polygonal figure. He is so complex that it's very hard to, uh, to explain him at all anymore. During that, um, the, the period after 1919, several memorial campaigns start up uh, to try and preserve Roosevelt's legacy in a grander, more accessible, and more permanent fashion, and they add even more angles to TR as, as well. But what I want to do tonight is show how Dewey's idea of this double creates three categories, broad categories, uh, of, of a, a Roosevelt that's been abused. And I want to start with frustration, that people get frustrated with how they can portray Roosevelt. Then I want to talk about wild exaggerations. Um, and then I want to talk about complete myth-making. There's kind of like a range of lies. Like, you know that, um, that website, PolitiFact? They've got like a dial that goes from telling the truth to liar, liar, pants on fire. That's kind of where we're going tonight. So kind of true, not really true, and then absolutely made up, you know? Uh, and that's where we are. We're at a stage now where there, you know, we, we need to decipher every Roosevelt that we see. So let me give you an example of each. And let's, oh, these are all the statues uh, that are out there. And of course, they're all different. And they're all there for different reasons. I mean, he's on Mount Rushmore because he's the only president that went to South Dakota. Um, he's on Theodore Roosevelt Island because he's not where Jefferson is in the Tidal Basin. He was supposed to be there, but Jefferson gets the place instead of him. He's, uh, he's, in, he's in front of the Museum of Natural History because he's a conservationist. So all of these things are put there uh, for various reasons. Uh, and equestrian horses. Roosevelt, before he died, told his wife, I do not want any statues of myself, and I definitely don't want any statues on horseback. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Guess what happens? I mean, it is the most popular depiction of Theodore Roosevelt, him on horseback. Uh, and there are tons of letters about that. He did not want to be memorialized like this. So what does that say about how we've decided to memorialize him? Okay, that is uh, J.N. Ding Darling. You may know him. He's a famous Floridian. Pat and I were talking about him last night. He's a cartoonist of some renown in the 20th century. Uh, and uh, I want to talk to you about his most famous cartoon that he ever drew. Um, and he's my example of frustration with how you memorialize Roosevelt. So Darling knew Roosevelt. In fact, um, they used to go horseback riding. They were both lovers of the outdoors. Um, they were both birders. And uh, we were just talking about, there's a bird preserve in Florida named after Darling uh, that uh, was in part due to Roosevelt's uh, preservation efforts. So 
when Roosevelt dies, you can imagine, Darling is uh, struck. In fact, he says he was in an emotional coma after he found out that his friend Roosevelt was, was dead. And his editor comes into his office in the morning and says, Ding, I need you to make a cartoon of Roosevelt. And Ding goes, great, I've got to draw my, my dead friend now, like, fantastic. But he sets to it with, with the understanding that this is something that he needs to do for the country. He needs to present Roosevelt, and that starts to weigh on him and become quite heavy. So he begins sketching, and he sketches this sort of figure of Roosevelt on horseback, because the last time that Darling had met Roosevelt, it was at Oyster Bay. They were riding colts, and uh, TR said he had to go in, that Edith was calling him for something. So he waved his hat at Darling and said goodbye. And that was the last time they saw each other. And so in, ingrained in Darling's memory is this sort of wave. And so he scribbles that out, and he thinks it's terrible, and he throws it to the floor. And then he keeps at it. For hours, he's drawing. One page after, after another hits the floor, and uh, he moves on. Finally, after two, three hours, he's there, and he's got nothing to show for it. He feels that everything that he's drawn has been a failure. He's frustrated. Uh, and he looks to the ground, and he sees the first drawing that he had done of that Roosevelt waving goodbye. And he goes, well, you know what? Maybe this could be Roosevelt waving goodbye to the nation. You know, no one's going to know it's him waving goodbye to me. And so maybe, maybe this will work. And he goes to his, um, he goes to his editor and he goes, here we go. This is, this is all I could come up with. I'm terribly sorry, but I, I can't do anything else. And the editor says, yeah, that's terrible. We're not going to publish that. And so he says, I'm just going to find an old photo of Roosevelt and put black trim around it, which was a popular way of saying that someone had died. The black trim represents mourning, right? And, um, and we're going to run that in the newspaper. And so the editor leaves, and he comes back, and he says, turns out all the photos have been burned. There was a big fire, and there's no Roosevelt photos at the newspaper. So he says, I need that cartoon. And Darling says, OK, but we've got we to gotta make this a little bit better. And so he starts adding a few features. I don't know if you can see this very well, and I don't think I can point, but um, down in the left-hand corner, there is a, a scribble of, a, of the Capitol uh, to represent Roosevelt's political life. And then up in the top right, you can see there's like a long procession of, uh, pioneer, it's like a pioneer trail, like, um, you know, with the covered wagons going. And this, he called it the Long, Long Trail then. And this was supposed to be Roosevelt riding off to heaven. He adds like the, uh, the sort of the ghostly lines at the bottom to make it look like TR is an apparition, right? And this is the long, long trail. Roosevelt waving goodbye to the nation and, um, and going into the, the heavens on that, that, that final ride. Darling was not happy with this at all. And he explained to his editor that he was really sorry that this is all he could offer. He goes to the newsstand in the morning and he sees in the front page of the Chicago Tribune his cartoon. It's on the front page of the newspaper and people are buying it up like crazy. They love it, just like he thought. People thought that this was Roosevelt waving goodbye to them. And it became Darling's most famous, most sought after, most reprinted, you know, there were special editions. This is his most popular thing that he's ever done. And it was born out of complete frustration and he thought it was terrible. So again, this is an example of how what is in our imagination might have huge relevance to all of us and might have real meaning and we might interpret it in a way that is really significant. There's other things I'm going to show you that are less than that, but let's just stay with this one for one last minute. Um, Darling's story is a good one because it says that none of us can remember Roosevelt in a way that matches reality. That's what he was trying to do, to make a Roosevelt that he knew saying goodbye to him. We draw on our memories which are faulty and subjective and they're only ours, but it's not to say that we can't remember an accurate portrayal. I mean, this is Roosevelt. It's just another portrayal of Roosevelt. And obviously, it touched those who view it. So it's not to say that all of these memorials, we should take them down, and they're not important. They are, but they're going to touch you differently than the, how they might touch someone else. Even the author of one will feel very different uh, from how the audience feels it. All right, the second thing I mentioned was wild exaggeration. So we're moving on from kind of true to Definitely not true. And if you, uh, this is one of, this is a Halloween movie. If you haven't seen this already, this is one of my favorites. It was actually a play, 1936, Joseph Kesselring runs this play. It's hugely popular. Frank Capra, you know, the famous uh, 40s and 50s director, um, produces, it turns it into a movie with Cary Grant. 
Um, Peter Lorre is in it, I think. Yeah, Peter Lorre and it's uh, Raymond Massey. It's a huge hit. Um, and um, it features the Brewster family. One of the Brewsters is Teddy Brewster, who thinks he's Theodore Roosevelt. And he runs up the stairs yelling, charge. He thinks it's San Juan Hill. And he's storming the Spanish blockhouse. Um, you know, that's Teddy Brewster. It's completely ridiculous, completely fabricated. Um, it's still a lot of fun. But there's over 100 motion pictures. There's probably more now. It's hard to keep track of all of them. Um, there's The Simpsons, which um, I realize now with my students, I am really out of date because they don't even like Simpsons jokes <laughs> anymore. But uh, in terms of wild exaggeration, I mean, that's what The Simpsons do. They do wild exaggeration. There's also <clears throat> The Wind and the Lion, which is a 1975 action adventure film, which is hugely popular. It's released uh, about five days after the Mayaguez incident, which for those of you that are Vietnam buffs or historians, no one's a buff of Vietnam, but um, if you know the Vietnam War, the Mayaguez incident is often seen as the last conflict of the Vietnam War. Um, this is released just after it, featuring Sean Connery, right, James Bond, and Candace Bergen. Uh, who you might know better from Murphy Brown, but this is, she was big in movies before she was in Murphy Brown. The movie is supposed to depict the Perticaris incident, and this is one that you, you probably might not remember, but uh, a Greek American called Eon Perticaris gets kidnapped by a Moroccan bandit in 1904. His name is Mouli Al Razuli. And uh, it turns out that Perticaris and Razuli get on pretty well, actually. Uh, but the incident sparks international outrage and Theodore Roosevelt is going to threaten military action and, uh, and eventually settle the matter through arbitration. So The Wind and the Lion is supposed to be about that incident. There's a couple wild exaggerations that we should immediately be able to pick out. One is that Sean Connery is not a Moroccan bandit, and he never tries to put on a Moroccan accent. He just has this Scottish accent throughout the film, but he wears the garb of a, of a, of a, a nomadic Moroccan. And Candace Bergen is not a bald Greek man. She is obviously blonde, full hair, uh, and stunning, right? Um, so that's wrong, too. But also, the TR character is wildly exaggerated, played by Brian Keith, who also plays Roosevelt in a Rough Riders film by the same director uh, that is on TV. Brian Keith is uh, a forceful orator, everything you might think he might be. But he also decides to invade Morocco, doesn't hold back. And so the entire film is a fabrication of the facts. None of it happened the way the film had it happened. But it's led you know, to us, to our idea of Theodore Roosevelt. This is my favorite wild exaggeration. And I don't put this in the liar, liar, pants on fire category. And I'll, I'll tell you why, right? So you know this film, A Night at the Museum. Has anyone not seen this? Where have you been for the last 20 years? <laughs> Under a rock. Under a rock. Okay, uh, I th I, look, it's not a bad film, I would rent it. Um, or you can't rent it anymore, <laughs> sorry, that's also outdated. Um, all right, I won't spoil the film in case you do wanna see it, but I'll just say that uh, the hero of the film is Ben Stiller who takes this job at the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, I do have to spoil it a little bit just to say that everything comes alive at night. Okay, that's, the, that's what happens in the movie. Everything comes alive in the film. Wild exaggeration. I'm pretty sure when the doors close at night, they don't all come alive, okay? But what's interesting is that, of course, Roosevelt's equestrian statue, which is inside, not outside, comes alive in the film, and it's, he's played by uh, Robin Williams. But what I love about the film is that in, in it, at one stage, Robin Williams alludes to the fact that this is all make-believe. He says in the film, he goes, I'm made of wax, Larry. Larry is the Ben Stiller character. In other words, this is all just make-believe. So there's kind of like a breaking of the fourth wall there that they do on theater when they kind of look to the audience and say, you know, this is all just make-believe, right? And I love that. That kind of puts it in the category of just a wild exaggeration and not completely made up. All right, now we're into myth-making. Completely made up, fabrications, bullshit, I think you would call it. <laughs> all right, this is uh, Schlitz. Um, interesting comparison today, I don't know, uh, how much of you uh, here know about the brewery business, but uh, this month, Modella beat out Budweiser as, the, as America's favorite beer. So uh, Modelo is a Mexican beer, I think, uh, although I'm pretty sure it's brewed here too. Um, but back in the 50s, the same thing was happening. There was a changing of the guard in the brewery world, and Schlitz was the biggest 
beer in America for like 60, 70 years. And now we don't see it too often. I don't even know if it's still made anymore. Um, but Anheuser-Busch was coming on pretty strong with Budweiser. And the Milwaukee Brewery Schlitz was looking for ways to revive their brand, to bring it back. So this is a, actually, this is a lesson for Budweiser what not to do, because Schlitz doesn't come back. And, and, there, and I don't know if this is the reason why, but they, they ran a number of ads starring Theodore Roosevelt, print ads at first. So in the 60s, these start out as print ads. The brewer alleged that Roosevelt brought, quote, a whole lot of Schlitz on his trip to Africa. <laughs> he didn't bring any Schlitz to his trip to Africa. But there are rumors that begin to persist out of the Schlitz brewery that there was a consignment. The consignment went to Mombasa, and there's a photograph somewhere. You can't find the photograph anywhere. There's no records of a consignment of Schlitz that went to Mombasa. Uh, but the tale goes on for years to come. In fact, in the 1970s, Schlitz, Schlitz doubles down. And I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of this, but they run a number of ads on TV with Sorrel Book, who uh, if you don't recall the name, he was Boss Hogg on Dukes of Hazard. So uh, Boss Hogg plays Theodore Roosevelt in the 70s in a, a series of ads for Schlitz Malt Liquor. And um, he portrayed Theodore Roosevelt as a beer-guzzling adventurer. In fact, I think the, the ad is supposed to depict the North Room, which is like the trophy room of Sagamore Hill. And um, TR didn't drink an awful lot. But when he did, he didn't drink Schlitz or beer, for that matter. So this is, uh, this is definitely liar, liar, pants on fire territory. The Theodore Roosevelt Association, uh, which is the sort of um, the group that keeps TR's legacy, perpetuates TR's legacy, they wrote to Schlitz saying that this was anachronistic, ahistorical, and uh, they even threatened to take legal action, kind of like Roosevelt did. Roosevelt sued a Michigan journalist who said that he was drunk and won. He won a dollar. Um, but the point was is that he won and he wanted to put his name right and the TRA threatened to do the same back in the 70s. Nothing ever came of it. Um, Schlitz didn't care. That's the bottom line. This was an opportunity for, to use an American icon as their, uh, as their brand, you know, to co-op TR to sell beer. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you look in some places today, you'll find the story is repeated by even good historians. Uh, and, and definitely by Milwaukee tourism boards, <laughs> right? He was shot in Milwaukee. He also drank a lot of beer from Milwaukee. That's kind of the vibe. Anyway, um, interestingly, TR is used for all sorts of commercial products. He never smoked cigarettes, but Norwegians in the 50s and 60s bought Tiedemann's with TR's face on them. Uh, if you look to the top middle there, uh, Roosevelt rarely drove cars. He didn't like driving in cars. He was a fan of horseback riding. And although he liked guns, he never used Rugers. He used Winchesters and uh, Remingtons. The advertisement on the right is what you would call guerrilla advertising. You just don't know what it's about. It's for cardboard boxes. And it was the most popular advertiser in America in the 1950s, the Container Corporation of America. They used TR's Im image at least five times on their ads. Um, whiskey, he did like whiskey. Uh, Cadillacs, he never drove in a Cadillac. And then Good to the Last Drop, which is Maxwell House's slogan that they say is Theodore Roosevelt's. But they were using the slogan before Theodore Roosevelt ever visited the Hermitage in Tennessee. So that's probably not true either. But you can see where the brand of Roosevelt can rub off on the brand of uh, corporate identity. He's trustworthy, he's American, he's kind of, you, you know who he is, right? All right, let me conclude. Um, right, our collective memories have thrown up some pretty interesting images of Roosevelt. Uh, some indelible, some are fleeting, some real, some patently false. But no matter the duration which they endure or the precision by which they are crafted, these memories shape our understanding of the president. And this is the real point. Roosevelt's legacy is up for grabs. When I said at the outset of this that you are the agents of his memory, that is exactly what I meant. You know, you decide if the statue stays up in the American Museum of Natural History. You get to either write the letter saying you want it down or you want it up. You are gonna get to tell me tonight, hopefully, what you would like to see in the legacy room of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. And, you know, if you wanna buy Schlitz, then you're making a decision there as well. Um, but that's the point. When you read a biography, you have to remember that the author has a reason why they wrote the words they wrote. The painter, Andy Warhol, painted Theodore Roosevelt. 
He had a reason. He wanted to depict him as a war criminal. Um, and politicians, if Donald Trump or Joe Biden say that they know what Teddy Roosevelt would do, they're doing it to win your votes. So all of this has purpose, as John Dewey predicted. I thought I would sum up uh, a little bit about history of the past and human understanding with a quote from Robert Fulham. And uh, Fulham, uh, if you recall a book called Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, uh, it was a really popular book in the 90s. It's sort of, um, uh, Fulham is a, uh, an author who, uh, he was a preacher actually, I think a Unitarian minister, and he tried to kind of condense all of his wisdom into that book. Uh, it's things like flush the toilet and be nice to people, but I think, you know, that makes sense too. He condensed his entire credo into one line that I'll read to you because I think it's interesting. He said, I believe the imagination is stronger than knowledge, that myth is more potent than history, and that dreams are more powerful than facts. And the reason why I like that line so much is because I also believe that the past can never be fully recovered, and that even if we have lived it, we can't fully recover it. I mean, think back to your 20s. Do you actually believe your memories in your 20s? I don't. Uh, there's certainly things that I've chosen to forgot, forget or will for, willfully have forgotten or just can't remember because my memory isn't great either. But um, Theodore Roosevelt is gone too and he can't be recovered. Even if you live with him, even if you're Ding Darling and you, you saw him wave goodbye to you, you can't remember him the way you want to remember him either. Um, we can recover him as a historian, we can find him in documents and we can write about him as I do, uh, but I don't think that my books are any closer to the truth uh, than Edmund Morris's book or Kathy Dalton's book or whoever writes about Theodore Roosevelt. The movies, even documentaries, they're the same. They don't fully reproduce the past as it happens, as we can tell. What we have is interpretation, speculation, and we can get down about that and think, well, um, you know, th that means everything has no meaning, and that's not what I'm saying here, actually. What I'm saying is that all of these things have meaning. It's actually a a, a kind of cornucopia or a rainbow of meaning rather than just one and rather than just none, right? So I think that's what I'm trying to get at here. I don't want to poke too much fun at our imagination. And so I want to pull it back to the idea of TR's ghost and, and to plug my book, naturally. Um, when Theodore Roosevelt's grandchildren used to visit Sagamore Hill, they used to say that the place was haunted by a ghost, the ghost of Theodore Roosevelt. In fact, it was Archie Roosevelt who uh, I get that line, Theodore Roosevelt's ghost from, that it was his idea. He said, we knew him only as a ghost, but what a merry, vital, and energetic ghost he was, and how much encouragement and strength he left behind for us to play the role that fate has assigned for us for the rest of the century. And that last bit is kind of the point of why we remember Theodore Roosevelt, that he leaves us something, an example, a model, even if it's just part of him and not all of him. I don't want to venerate all of Theodore Roosevelt. There's things about him that... I don't, I don't think are great, and there's other things that I think are magnificent. But his point was, was that he left something behind and something for us to interpret, something for us to consider, something for us to find meaning in, and what a merry, vital, and energetic figure we have to draw upon. Thank you.